Thank you, Commissioner Pate, so much for being with us today. I have a couple of questions regarding our food chain in Alabama. I'm sure that you've seen some of these videos that are being put out by farmers and ranchers across the country. Uh, they're freaking out about the food supply chain. And I want you to give us an update how you feel about those videos and what is happening in Alabama. Are we destroying crops and animals, pouring milk out? Um, give us a rundown on what's happening in Alabama, please. Well, I appreciate you calling and I appreciate you trying to get the information that I know to be true. Of course, I don't know everything, but yeah, I, I know most, a lot about the food supply chain and have been, that's been a, a, the new buzzword now, not farmers, not grocery store, but the whole food supply chain. And yeah, and so we'll, you asked me a couple of different questions talking about how healthy is the food supply chain. Um, it's really been interesting. Uh, obviously, nobody's been through a crisis like this before, but um, when this all began to happen really quickly, we began to work with the, Dr. Harris and public health and began to talk to uh, Director Hastings. And it was, I really I was real pleased that everybody understood what we were trying to say that it was more than farmers and grocery stores there were truckers involved there were processors involved there was distribution involved there was warehouse involved lots of different things touch the food supply system and uh, and i got great cooperation from the governor's office to dr harris's office to the director and 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 i I knew because of the president position he was taking and of course knowing Secretary Purdue and his background in agriculture, I felt like they understood, but yeah, they really did also. We were in the loop on really almost weekly briefings with the White House, on weekly briefings with USDA. And so everybody kind of understood and that didn't change that there were problems or some um, glitches in the system, but yeah, it was so easy to communicate with other people and get them on board. But yeah, so we kind of gotten through that where everybody wanted to be named critical infrastructure and we began to understand what was critical. And, you know, some of it's not as intuitive as you would think, uh, like pest control. We had to make sure that they stayed working because we couldn't have our food supplies after we process it to be um, damaged in any way or any kind of diseases. Because it, during all of this, what is going on, we had to make sure our food supplies continue to be safe, too. And that's the responsibility of the Department of Ag. But... Yeah, as far as what you see in the video, some of them are sad, but certainly not most, uh, hardly any of those have played out in Alabama. To my knowledge, and I've talked to lots of people about it, we poured out zero milk in the state of Alabama. Um, you know, we don't have the produce business here. They do in Florida. I understand in Florida and some other states like California, they might have had to plow some the produce under we've done zero in alabama in fact our produce growers and i think some of the credit goes to this new sweet grown alabama.org website has been connecting uh producers with consumers and but our people are telling us they're having a banner year having a better year and i've heard of zero uh food having to be uh, trash because there wasn't a venue to sell it in. And so we worked hard, really hard with, as far as our farmers markets in the state, which is okay. uh, a lot of those people's primary source of income, uh, the smaller farmers. And, and so we first thought, well, there's no way you can keep a farmer's market open, but we really were able to, I think every farmer's market open statewide except for one. And that was really for some different reasons. And, than just food safety. Uh, there's been no animals of any type euthanized in the state of Alabama. Up until the first of this week, there'd been no cattle euthanized nationwide. Now, certainly yes. there's been some poultry. Alabama's a huge poultry state. We're normally about second in the nation the amount of poultry we produce, but still we hadn't had to depopulate or euthanize any poultry that I'm aware of. And I was with the head of poultry and egg all day yesterday. And that's still the case. People look at the grocery store and say, well, the shortage is there. It's absolutely no shortage. We, I mean, I say it five times a day. 
Our food supply system is safe, it's abundant, and it's sustainable. I mean, we're food secure in this country. That's one of the great things about being an American. You know, you can need a, a computer chip from China, but we don't need anybody else to feed us. We can feed ourselves tomorrow, we can feed ourselves next year, and it'll just keep replenishing itself. So, um, yeah, are there glitches? Sure. We've had a massive amount of overbuying. Uh, I hate to use the word hoarding, but so you know, <laughs> is that why we are seeing shortages in the store? It's not that we don't have a good supply; it's that people are hoarding. Is that well? I don't want for that. You no, know, that's that's certainly part of it. That's not to say we hadn't had any. We've realized one of the problems. Let's take beef for a second, because it's it's probably our most complicated supply system, but. We probably as a nation allowed that to get consolidated into four or five companies controlling and producing 80% of the beef. And so what, not that that in itself is a problem. The problem is those plants got so big once they got a little COVID or got some COVID-19 in them, then yeah, the, you know, you get one plant and I'm not saying that one plant is 10%, but I'm saying one company might own or control 20% of the marketplace. And, and so that one plant goes down because they've got enough coronavirus to have to do that. Then yeah, that creates, you know, you lose 5% of production capacity. We got tremendous supply and, and it's a long supply chain. And so that those cattle are working through the marketplace about to get to the slaughterhouse and then they just have to stop. And then when they start back up in a week, then, you got those cows plus what was coming that week also. And so sometimes uh, we've had to struggle. But so some of those, I'd say there have been some problems, but those are really short term. I mean, they'll close for a day or two, clean the place up and get it back on running. You know, there's plenty of meat protein out there. I mean, we've got tons. We're the second biggest uh, catfish producing state in the nation. I'd love to encourage your uh, folks who have some Alabama U.S. farm raised catfish. Of course, there should be plenty of poultry. Uh, like I said, our, our statewide poultry is probably at 90% production and it's phenomenal. So, but some of those cuts of meat, you know, are different. You know, obviously, filet requires a different um, cut of chicken of a breast than. Uh, than maybe a housewife would want in the grocery store. So it's not as simple to retool all those plants and start producing for uh, a home or families uh, what they want, you know, and then, um, you know, there's just lots of misinformation. You get people saying, well, why are we getting imports of, of beef? But um, I mean, we're a net exporter of beef. You know, beef agriculture is one of our real shining examples where nobody can out uh, produce us. I mean, we're just so efficient in our culture. And so we've got all these trade agreements. You can't, we can produce so much more beef than what we can consume. And a lot of the things we sell overseas are, are things like, I don't think we consume, but about 30% of the livers that are produced here. Some people eat beef livers, but some people don't, but there's huge markets for that overseas. Uh, uh, beef tongues is something very few of us eat, but there's a huge market for it. So you, if you stop imports, you can, most countries are not going to let you export to them also. And I'm saying we're net exporters. So those things really work to our advantage. So we're sending tons of of ag agricultural products around the world and not just feeding our country, but the world. So let me move on to a couple of other things I'd like you to address. Um, we are seeing that farmers, and this is maybe some of this is coming from the videos, that they're not making very much money, a buck a pound or so on their beef, but the stores are selling it for so much higher. Where is that extra money going? Because it doesn't seem like it's going to the farmers. What's the situation there? Okay, well, of course, I'll start off by saying I'm not an economics professor, but I think I sort of understand it. But I was, before I started this job, I'd been in business for 37 years. And so there's no doubt that farmers, especially cattlemen right now, you know, there's some, I think, peanuts and a few things that hadn't had that big a hit and our produce is doing fine. But yeah, let's just take cattle. Um, so 
when those plants slow down, I'm going to make up numbers. Let's just say that day we're supposed to kill 100 cows. Well, the plant goes down so you don't kill any or you kill 50 with those other 50 you're standing out there. Well, then the plant shut down a week. So you look around at the end of a week and you got five or 600 cows and you got the other ones coming that were supposed to be processed that day. Well, they're not going to go out and pay a premium to bring more cattle into the system while the system has been glitched. And so that's some of it. Now, we actually wrote a letter. I think we wrote it April the 6th to Senator Shelby and Jones and asked them to help us try to understand it because the system doesn't work like a normal supply and demand. And it's frustrating because and so anyway, the, the ask of them was that Senator Grassley from Iowa and Senator Bounds from South Dakota had asked the Department of Justice to sort of investigate these packers and try to help us understand why this was happening. And so to their credit, both uh, Senator Jones and Shelby have been very cooperative. Uh, we actually got the president about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago now, to issue uh, a white paper saying he was asking the uh, um, Department of Justice to investigate it. but And so that needs to happen. This isn't the first time that's happened in the beef. We actually had a fire at a Tyson plant a year or so ago. And after that, prices plummeted for the cattlemen and they went up real high at the grocery store. And so um, there's something there that we need to look at. And there's a lot of things floating around from having uh, packers not being so large and having them more regional so this wouldn't happen again. I think you're going to see once we get through the next month or two and things kind of get stabilized, there's going to be some people looking into why that market uh, performed like it did during this crisis. One of the things that I, I was talking to a couple of folks that raise cows and they're taking them to local processors and they are booked up through May of next year and it's we so it would be great to see more people starting pro local processing plants, but the regulations are so high. Tuesday, President Trump signed a new executive order on regulatory relief to support economic recovery. Do you think that will lead into Alabama being able to open more local processing plants? I think the trend in all of our food is more local, and so yeah, I think you're going to see that in meat. Uh, uh, production too. There's obviously a much bigger demand for people to want to buy a side of beef or we've yeah. got some advantages in Alabama in that you can have, you can't, the farmer can't go process it, but he could sell that, that side to as many people as he wanted in Alabama. That's not true in every state. So you could go in with 20 of your friends and buy parts you wanted the ground beef or you wanted a certain percentage of the ground beef or whatever. And so that's really available, certainly against government regulations. I, I've always felt that they were an impediment to a lot of times businesses being successful. And that's what this economy needs is successful businesses. But from this side, you know, we have a huge responsibility to keep people's food safe. Absolutely. I would say the rules aren't that onerous or, difficult to abide by. And so, um, you know, it's easy to say to a factory, relax this regulation. It's a little different when you tell the people that are guaranteeing that food's safe that you know, we're not going to do that anymore when there's a specific reason we do that so that we know our food's safe. Well, that's, that's a good point. Um, on Wednesday, President signed the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program for $19 billion that they're going to start circulating and 16 will go direct payments to farmers. What are you hearing from people in Alabama? Are I'm sure they're happy with it, but do you know how that money will be used here? Well, it about includes everybody. So I think the only commodity I know I jumped out at me is peanuts. You had your your mm -hmm. Whatever you grow had to, the price had to decline at least 5%. And I think in peanuts it hadn't, but most of our produce, certainly our cattle and, and, uh, but yeah, how the program is just like, we keep coming back to beef because that seems to be what people see. But in the, say, uh, I think it's soon, well, we know cattle prices have fallen over 5%. So I know that the way the system is going to work is if you sold cattle between January the 15th and April 15th, and they've got a formula 
but let's just say you're going to get $130 per head that you sold during those three months. And if you, if anybody remembers, that was a, that was when we first started having all those really bad problems with the first of April in the beef industry. And so we had some stockyards closing, we had different issues. And so there was no demand. So that's certainly appropriate to pay people during that period of time. Now, if you sold on April 16th, you don't get that. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things okay. that if you fall out now, what you do get, they give you, there's another program, a part of that where you'll get about $33 per head and so let's say you made the decision, you saw prices were bad, so you didn't sell because you knew prices were so terrible, then at least you're still holding that cow or calf or whatever, and they're going to give you $33 for just every okay. calf, bull, anything on your farm. And then that program goes across the board into specialty crops, non-specialty crops. So, yeah, it's a, I appreciate the president kind of tailoring our program just for producers and because there's no allowance in there for any businesses were impacted, even ag businesses impacted. You had to be a producer of a okay. uh, crop. That was good. Now there's a lot of our viewers like the idea of country of origin labeling. You're not a huge fan of this and that we've tried it, but it didn't really work. Can you explain that to people out here who, who think it's a good thing? We created, since I've been here, a whole branding program called Sweet Grown Alabama. I'm all about buying local, buying Alabama. Yeah, I'm all about branding. Why? And of course, it, I think they had it from 2011 to 2015, and they ended up having to repeal it because of NAFTA and other regulations there again, if we enter these trade agreements with Mexico and Canada, then we have to honor our side too. And so we were, I think, facing, I heard Secretary Purdue say the other day about a billion dollar lawsuit from other countries because we were doing that. And so I heard him say the other day, somebody asked him about, uh, they use the acronym uh, MCU for mandatory country of origin labeling. Um, if we were looking at that again, he said, yeah, when somebody gives them a billion dollars, because that's what it'll cost. But in a lot of ways, it doesn't help. It sounds good, like a lot of things do. But we need some of that lean meat. We've gotten so efficient as a country at raising beef that, 80 something percent of what we raise is going to grade either prime or choice and we need some lean meat well you don't want to tell some farmers well, we're going to create a market for lean meats which would be like cold cows and and stuff that hadn't been fed and we're just going to grind up that meat so they're going to take a huge hit on what they're going to get so sometimes it's cheaper uh, for us to bring in lean meat and it, it actually helps the farmer too, because then we have some things that we, I mentioned earlier about the tongues and different things. Some things we just don't have enough use for by themselves and fat trimming is one of those. And there's a huge amount of fat trimming that comes with butchering a, a, a livestock or cattle. And so we're able to take some of that lean meat rather than throw away those fat trimmings, mix it with our fat trimming. And then it makes a, um, a profit center as opposed to expense to that to that packer so i mean I think, I think people are concerned that we're getting meat from other countries that don't have as high standards as we do and i understand most of the hamburger like a fast food hamburger most of that is imported is that correct I, I don't know that I can answer that most, okay. uh, you know, obviously Wendy's it and you might've heard a week or two ago about Wendy's uh, sort of ran out of ground meat. And why would that be? Well, Wendy's advertise they sell fresh, never frozen ground patties. So that's obviously not being shipped from Africa or Brazil. And so obviously that's, they have to have a just in time delivery system because they're dealing with a product that's not frozen. And so they can't have a warehouse in Birmingham that's got frozen beef just waiting on somebody to demand it. So um, I'm not sure about those, but yeah, I think as far as well, the first part of your comment about, well, it's food safe. I mean, I guarantee you, we've got the safest food supply system in the history of mankind, Absolutely. in the history of the, and so what, it's really only one country in Africa, 
I don't know that I can even say it, Namibia, uh, and they can only export uh, lean beef to us. And then, of course, we get some, but it's such a small fraction. I think I saw it was like 0 0.08 or something of the lean meat that comes in the country in the same way. But I'm saying you got to recognize we're a net exporter. So if we start making all these rules, it's really one of our real, you know, things that helps us with our trading. And so you can't say, you know, one side, we're not going to let any of your stuff in, but here, take this from us. So, Well, closing thoughts, as we are still in the middle of this crisis, what is the main thing that you want viewers to know about Alabama, the food supply chain, and how things are going here? Uh, I hope we're not in the middle. So <laughs> what I hope we're closer to the end of the middle. But yeah, I say it. Our food supply is safe. It's abundant. It's sustainable. I say that every day. If, it, if that's the biggest thing you have to worry about, I, you're going to be okay. I promise. Uh, uh, we're doing, I've been, this is my first foray into state politics. It's been a year and a half, and I, I've been impressed by how the state agencies have worked together and cooperated. In fact, we were just given 200,000 masks, 60,000 gloves, 25 cases of sanitizer for us to get out to the poultry process of workers, not to the companies. We, get, we specifically, in fact, I, can't, I was trying to talk to you yesterday while I was traveling around giving those out so that they can try to protect themselves while they're at home. And then the company's got to protect them while they work. And so that all came through Alabama uh, Director Hastings' office. And they I didn't pay a dime for it. And it was provided to me to distribute. To, and we distributed to catfish processing workers. So my message would be is we work hard on this every day. To, and I'm sorry there's any shortages of anything, but we've done pretty doggone well, I think. Well, that's very encouraging news and an encouraging word for all of us. So thank you so much for your time. It's, I'm glad that you're in the position that you're in. Keep doing a great job. Thanks, Becky.